All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Silverstein. I'm the co-director of the Media, Medicine, and Health programs here at Harvard Medical School. Our programs are dedicated to using storytelling to try to build a more just and healthy world. More than just raise awareness, the goal of our programs is to try to elevate the voices of people too often deliberately silenced or preferentially unheard and to try to advance health and human rights. For those of you interested in learning more about our programs, joining us by Zoom, there will be links posted throughout. We're currently accepting applications for both the master's program and our certificate program. For those of you in the room who are not currently enrolled in one of our programs, uh, happy to talk with you afterwards about it as well. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, it's my privilege to now welcome to our, our, you to our panel discussion here on portraying HIV AIDS in the media, how far have we come? Uh, to introduce our panel this evening, tonight we have joining us the very handsome two-time <laughs> Emmy Award winning, th this is basically gonna be like five minutes of me flirting with the panel. Um, uh, <laughs> Two-time Emmy Award-winning director, producer, writer, Paris Barclay of Sons That's of me. Anarchy. Station, yeah. Absolutely. I prefer well-preserved, though. Well, well, <laughs> well very well-preserved. Well uh, Adams House alum, uh, a watcher, uh, ER, and soon, Gladiator. Uh, we have also joining us uh, Emmy Award-nominated actress, dancer, and author, Gloria Rubin, who has... Uh, well known, and we'll discuss this evening. We're very lucky to have her here to talk about her portrayal of Jeannie Boulay on ER, uh, the first character on television to portray someone living a full life with HIV. She's since been in Mr. Robot, Lincoln, and City on a Hill. We have with us uh, one of, I have to say, one of my, my favorite human beings, hero, AIDS activist from ACT UP, co-founder of TAG, Nation's public health columnist, writer for, for Pest Magazine, that's a big one there, um, uh, and MacArthur Genius Grant winner, Greg Gonzalez is with us. The picture of me hugging Greg's about to be my profile picture for everything forever. Uh, photographer and dancer, Kia LeBeja, whose social commentary and art has been featured in Art Aids America, the Tate Modern Studio M Museum, and many more. We have with us the director, the founding director of the Global Health Delivery Master's Program here in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, and just all around force for health equity throughout the world, Joya Mukherjee. My people are the loudest. Um, and this panel will be moderated by the award-winning television writer, producer, co-director of the Media, Medicine, and Health program, Neil Baer. Yeah. With that, I'll turn things over to Neil. Thank you so much, Jason, and welcome to everyone here and everyone who's Zooming around the world. Um, it's a pleasure to have people who really care about HIV, AIDS, today because it is still very much with us. 13% um, of folks in the United States who have HIV don't know they have it. Uh, black individuals account for 40% of new infections. Um, for every 100 people diagnosed in 2021, 75% receive some care. 54% received um, care and it's ongoing, and 66% um, are vir virally suppressed. So that means one out of three are not. Um, why is that when we have PrEP and we have antiretrovirals for years? No one should be um, contracting HIV. Um, the really shocking statistics today on World's, World AIDS Day is that um, one in two black men uh, will get, uh, who have non-heterosexual sex, will have HIV in their lifetime. One out of five Latinx men will, and one out of 11 white men. So obviously there's still a problem. Obviously there's still a suppression of the, 
of the conversation and the stories about HIV AIDS, and that's why we're so fortunate to have this really renowned panel. So we're gonna start uh, right next to me with Greg Gonzalez, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to show some slides, some clips um, of the work of, of our uh, panelists, and um, they'll speak, and then they'll um, have a short conversation with each other after each one presents, and then we'll move on to some questions. So first we'll start with Greg. Detect this. Living with HIV, I learned I could stay undetectable with fewer medicines. That's why I switched to Devado. Devado is for some adults who are starting an HIV-1 treatment or replacing their current HIV-1 regimen. Detect this. No other complete HIV pill uses fewer medicines to help keep you undetectable than Devado. Detect this. Most HIV pills contain three or four medicines. Devado is as effective with just two. Research shows people who take HIV treatment as prescribed and get to and stay undetectable can no longer transmit HIV through sex. Don't take Devado if you're allergic to its ingredients or if you take Defetilide. Taking Devado with Defetilide can cause serious or life-threatening side effects. Hepatitis B can become harder to treat while on Devado. Don't stop Devado without talking to your doctor as your hepatitis B may worsen or become life-threatening. Serious or life-threatening side effects can occur, including allergic reactions, lactic acid buildup, and liver problems. If you have a rash or other allergic reaction symptoms, stop Devato and get medical help right away. Tell your doctor if you have kidney or liver problems, or if you are, may be, or plan to be pregnant. Devato may harm your unborn baby. Use effective birth control while on Devato. Do not breastfeed while taking Devato. Most common side effects are headache, nausea, diarrhea, trouble sleeping, tiredness, and anxiety. Detect this. I stay undetectable with fewer medicines. Ask your doctor about switching to Devato. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the role of media in the HIV epidemic, and we've, we're gonna talk about some brilliant portrayals of HIV, um, both in, in, in fiction and in, in, not in non-fiction portrayals that we've seen in TV and media. But if you think about AIDS now and the, the, what you see most commonly are ads like this for, for antiretroviral medications. <laughs> Not complaining, I'm alive today because I'm on those drugs. I took them this morning, no, not complaining. But there's a story here that almost you wish for like the butterflies and the birds and the Disney characters <laughs> popping out. People were saying, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Christina, can you go back to Greg's, yeah, just leave it on that, yeah. So, so think about the story that's told here. Everybody's so damn happy as Joy just said to me, right? it erases almost all the complexity that Neil sort of brought up about what's going on in the AIDS epidemic today, right? Um, people couldn't be happier to be HIV positive. They, they're, they're living lives that seem to be, they're on a beach, they're having nice dinners, they're, they're in art galleries. What could be better than living with HIV in 2023? Um, I think that um, this is a pernicious use of the media, so don't try this at home, right? <laughs> the point is, is that, as Neil said, we are, um, in some ways, better off than we were 20, 25 years ago and we didn't have the drugs to treat an infection that keep me alive and keep you alive. Um, but the point is, is that the situation is dire, right? As Neil said, 50% of black MSM will turn HIV positive by their 50th birthday, right? When we look at the United States, we have, some, we have rates of HIV in certain parts of this country, particularly in the rural South, that rival those in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, and so we have a whole set of issues that we need to deal with that are obscured by this sort of happy, clappy version of, of the HIV epidemic that is perpetuated night after night on network television, cable television about what this epidemic is about. You know, I once said, um, actually in this room, I think, um, infectious diseases are always gonna be with us, but epidemics are human creations, right? We throw people into the paths of epidemics. Right, and none of this is is, is discussed in the context of, of these kinds of um, recreations of people living with HIV as consumers of pharmaceutical products. Um, if we think about what put people at risk in the United States for HIV transmission, it's violence, it's substance use, it's mental health. None of this is talked about in the context of of, of these kinds of portrayals of people living with HIV. If we think about the social fractures in our geography that we saw in COVID nineteen, right? Um, we know who gets who, who, who's first in line when it comes to a new infectious disease, whether it's COVID, it's MPOX, or it's HIV. It's poor people, 
It's people of color. It's people who are also stigmatized for other reasons. They're people who use drugs. They're people who are engaged in sex work. They're people who, who are experiencing homelessness, people that are incarcerated, right? So I think we have to be careful about the way in which um, we've lost the plot a little bit, right? We've lost the plot a little bit about what this epidemic is about, what causes infectious diseases to take hold uh, in our communities, in our societies, in our world. Um, you know, during the COVID pandemic, people were like, did we, did, do you think we learned the lesson of HIV? And I'd say, hell no. <laughs> we just recapitulated it again and again. A million people are dead in the United States. More than a million people are dead from, from COVID-19. Yet, um, we basically turned our back on the pandemic as if it was all over and we didn't have to worry, worry about it at all. About 3,000 people die a week still from COVID in the United States. That's a 9-11 every week, right? And that's our new normal that we seem to be accepting. Um, a couple of other things. You know, these drugs, I take them, other people take them, but we still have a long way to go, right? We've heard today, we've been discussing sort of the political challenges to HIV. President Trump, set up a program called Ending the HIV Epidemic, invested in ending the HIV epidemic within the next 10 to 15 years. You can hate him as much as you want, but he put that on the table. Now Republican Congress want to pull all the funding for ending the epidemic program. They want to kill the PEPFAR program, which has helped to get AIDS drugs to millions of people around the world, right? And their legal challenge is to PrEP provision um, to, to men who have sex with men. Um, there, are, there are state initiatives to pull funding for HIV prevention for people um, who use drugs for, for, for gay men and sex workers. Um, there's a whole set of political challenges that again are obscured by sort of this relentless sort of framing of people with HIV and the AIDS epidemic as a consumer problem of consumer choice, right? Pick the drug that you only have to take a few pills a day for. Then you'll, then you'll solve the problem that's the big problem in your life. I think we need to sort of step back and think about how do we build a critical media discourse about the AIDS epidemic moving forward because you know, we didn't learn the lesson for COVID. We didn't learn the lesson of HIV. We didn't learn the lesson of COVID. And we don't get three strikes. Three strikes and we're out. Great. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I was going to say, Greg, <laughs> if I work for a major drug manufacturer who produces a commercial like this, I would think, I would tell myself anyway, I was doing something very good because I was putting out portrayals of you know, black men with other black men, that's a good thing. Everyone's hair seemed to be very well done, even their beards. <laughs> You're taking that personally. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, and actually it's showing people living as opposed to the narrative of people dying. And that's a good thing. Why is it so bad? And I, I think you only got to the beginning of why it's so bad. Because what it really is, is they found a way to get people to take a pill for the rest of their lives. They don't care about what it is or really what the disease is. But this is going to be money for them for as long as these people live if they get started. And that, to those companies, is a big deal. That's something worthy of investing in commercials like that because it's a long-term thing. And it's so wonderful to them when you can find an illness that needs to be treated forever because the pills are going to be $1,000 or something or $3,000 a month, and there's always going to be money. So we also have to be critical of the why of that commercial. Mm -hmm you know, of what that is really about. It is not about portraying, you know, that we live with HIV and that's okay and we're accepted. And even if we, if white people bring us a dog, you're allowed to pet it. I mean, <laughs> it's not so, it's all those messages are really trying to obscure their real message, which is give me some money um, forever. Uh, and it's, and I don't care about you really, which I think is why this, what you guys are doing is so critical because we have to put out other narratives that tell other aspects of the story and make other people the hero that aren't driven by money and aren't driven by people trying to make money off of a disease. Yeah, and, and also the representation, which is important in the context of the work we all do, um, is, is sort of perverted in this in this commercial to, to basically obscure racism, obscure homophobia, and misogyny, right? As if those aren't forces that have basically driven the AIDS epidemic all around the world. And so, yes, it's all about making money and for these companies to make money off of us, but it creates as, as, as a class of consumers devoid of any sort of social forces that you, as Joya would call them uh, in, in our lives. I'd like to- Class issues as well. Class yeah. Yes. Um, I, um, I have- complicated feelings about this ad. Um, I have seen people die of AIDS and, um, you know, those who have witnessed 
-hmm. in person. We know how traumatic that can be. It's incredible the medicines that have, you know, how the medical community has saved lives as, you know, as is evident right here at this table. Um, this ad is uh, so glossy that um, that's disturbing in its own right. What I'd like to, it, it's glossy and hopeful and kind of, um, like you say, Disneyland. It's a little bit, what I would like to see with an ad like this or something similar is a balanced, um, more of a balanced message. Mm -hmm. That yes, you can be on the beach in California having a good time with your spouse and dogs come up and you know, you can be like all of that stuff. You can be at dinner, you can, you know, whatever, whatever rocks your world. Um, and at the same time, you know, have these images of, of people in the South or statistics that pop up just kind of, I, I don't know, I'm not a director. Well, every actor wants to be a director, but whatever. <laughs> but, you know, just have a more balanced message that it isn't, it, it can be some of this, but it isn't just this. And it's the opposite that needs to be shown as well. So that communities that may see a commercial like this, they think, oh, well, that can never be me. Like those in the role south, oh, that, you know, that's not my life. Mm -hmm. So maybe show images of people in those communities that maybe don't have access or awareness or the right information that this can be for them as well. But the reason you don't see that is because those people don't have money well, and they it, don't have insurance. No, 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 indeed. However, un unless there are, it's like me when I was a kid, there was nobody on television that looked like me ever, ever. So if you don't see yourself up there, then you're not apt to believe that you can actually, uh, it's a little complex, you know what I mean? It's complicated, but, well, yeah. but I just want it so, to be more balanced. So, I think we have to have counter programming, right? Like, <laughs> yes, like, yeah. like Gilead is never going to make that, that commercial, but I would love to, like to have a public service announcement yes. yeah. that is slickly produced that that tells the, the side of the story we need to hear. But, because they don't have money. That's yeah. another thing. The healthcare infrastructure in many of these places is is yeah. un, un, unable it, to provide this prevention treatment services they need. We need counter narratives. That's it, the main. And also, that's what I'm saying. And yeah. uh, forgive me. Oh. And and if, if it were to be at the end of this commercial or interwoven in some way, because people don't know that these communities exist, yeah. that they are don't have the money to access the if, that politically, you know, there are people that are in office that are actually not taking funds from the federal government specifically for that cause. And unless people know about it, they're not going to do anything. About it. Joy, what about poverty and its effect? So we're, what we're talking about is the depiction of the images are of, the depiction of the images are of people who are middle, upper middle class. So Joya, I know you want to add to this, but also the issue of poverty in the United States and its relationship to HIV. Right. I mean, I think that we, yeah, there are two sort of things that related to that. I mean, one is that, as Paris said, this is about making money by getting people on new drugs. To many extents, these are Me Too drugs, right? There may be much cheaper alternatives. And indeed, around the world, we can treat HIV for $60 per month with perfectly reasonable drugs that people have been on for a very long time. Um, so there, there's a way that we're trying to, you know, this has become almost like male pattern baldness, like it's a, it's a marketing ploy. So that's really important. And then the second thing is the, the, the journey that people take to care, you know, we're both of these master's programs are in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, understanding the social forces that keep people away from care, whether it's transportation, whether it's not having time off for work to go to see the doctor, whether it's not having a doctor who looks like you, a nurse who looks like you, whether it's not uh, you know, having to trade you know, uh, your rent money for some additional medical care. And so I think when we think about this, this is, you know, everybody has an SUV, everybody has, you know, a, a bunch of leisure time, but that's actually not the case with the majority of the AIDS pandemic. Um, in the world, the majority of people with AIDS are impoverished people and have gotten HIV because of their impoverishment. And I'll talk about that in my remarks as well. I think also the thing is that going back to balance is that what we see in commercials are extremes. Like this is an extreme. And like things that we were seeing in the 80s, I remember um, 
the commercial of the <laughs> the uh, bowling bowling pins, people as bowling pins, and um, the what were they called? Um, Grim Reaper, Grim Reapers, and bowling pins bowling these people living with HIV. Or when I was in when I was in high school, I saw a commercial on MTV where it was three heterosexual couples having sex, and then the man pulls out a gun and shoots the woman in the head. And then at the end of the commercial, it's a bullet in a condom. And so then we see this, going from that, you see this, and it's just these extremes, and there's there's no balance. And the question is, is, is how do you, like, how do you formulate balance, I think is the question, because I, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for what feels good as something that you can see that feels both realistic and hopeful, um, except the things maybe that I, personally make, but um, yeah, I think the extremities is a big issue. So we're gonna, we're gonna move on. So thank you, Greg. It's a really a, a good way to start that we're still dealing with this kind of never, never land of HIV AIDS. It's not too common to see characters with HIV on, on television still. I think, uh, you know, it tends to be characters who um, are on shows like Pose. A lot of shows of the past, like the past is where H HIV and AIDS were on Pose or it's a sin. But in the present, as we're saying, there are a lot of people who contract HIV every year. And we need to see those characters, those people um, portrayed, and we need to see them portrayed as they are per the CDC data, and it's uh, predominantly uh, people of color. So we're gonna, we're gonna move on to Joya, so we're gonna show a clip and then... Uh, uh, to, I'm gonna so. just make a couple comments right. first. So, you know, I think uh, my introduction to the epidemic was really in Africa in the early 90s. I had been an AIDS activist as a college student, uh, going to college as Greg did, starting in 1981, which is when HIV, uh, you know, was <laughs> sort of realized. <laughs> um, that's really overactive, isn't it? Um, but what what really shocked me, you know, and I I worked with a lot of people who were activists who had been marginalized. But really, what really shocked me in going to Africa was when I worked with young people and asked them why they were at risk for AIDS, and they told me poverty over and over again, over and over again, and particularly girls said, you know, school is not free auntie, and if I need to go to school and I'm already an orphan, I'm gonna trade sex for school fees or for food or for transport, because if I don't learn to read and write, I'll definitely end up getting HIV. So if I can make some arrangement in my community with somebody I know. And it, it really changed my life um, of all the education I've had. And that's why for our students in global health and social medicine, we are so keen on you talking to people who have lived experience and not assuming we know what the issues are, because the issues are so deep and they're deeply entrenched with racism, capitalism, and these social forces like the political economy of drugs. And so when I started working at PIH, we were just treating a handful of patients with HIV, and I found that so rewarding just because I knew that around the world, nobody was getting HIV treatment. And Sub-Saharan Africa at that time, 8,000 people were dying a day from HIV. Not a one of them had access to free treatment. And so, you know, this, some of you have seen Bending the Arc, which is a, a story about partners in health. But um, what we've tried to do is really highlight the voices of people and their experiences. So, clip. People were saying, wow, you know, no, if they, they can do this in Haiti, we can do this in Thailand. If they can do this in Haiti, we can do it in Soweto. If they can do this in Haiti, we can do it in Seattle. And people started talking about the Haiti model. And our patients wrote something that is called the Declaration of Conj, and they said, we have benefited from the fruits of science, and we think our brothers and sisters in Africa should too. C'est Declaration Conj. Nous même malades dans un mille à santé, dans Conjio, nous gagnons une déclaration, nous t'en remettons devant nous toutes. C'est nous qui malades, c'est nous qui déclarons souffrance nous. Misez nous, Douleur nous, espoir nous tout. 
Nous avons un message pour nous même qui souffrent de même maladie avec nous. Nous t'en remercions. Pas découragé parce que vous n'avez pas de médicaments. Nous ne pouvons pas bouquer vous pour tout le monde capable de jouer les médicaments avec bon la soignage. Nous avons un message pour vous chaque radio. Si vous sorti dans notre pays, si vous sorti dans le pays d'Haïti, nous demandons pour nous prendre conscience de tout ça en avance duré. C'est pour nous mettre à côté tout égoïste parce que tout le monde c'est monde. Thank you. Turn off. So, you know, I think the for us, the, the, the patients that we had treated, and at that time in 2001, it was only about 50 patients. But they themselves understood, and one of the things I've learned so much from Haiti is the level of consciousness about world affairs and about the world. And these Haitian peasants, they were mostly peasants, um, they actually understood that the example of them getting AIDS treatment and doing better, and both of those people, one has passed away, Nurland, but Teofa is still alive. He works full time as an AIDS educator and a community health worker, and they understood that they had a message for their brothers and sisters in Africa, and Haitians are particularly connected with their idea of being in the diaspora of Africa, um, and so I think for us elevating their voice. And what you see is it's quite sophisticated. This is not um, you know, a very simple thing. They're talking about the big people in the world, the Gorshabwak. They're talking about the fact that you know, we might be poor, but we're not dumb, and that we all have the right to health. And this is at a time where nobody was getting antiretroviral therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa, in most of Asia, in a lot of Latin America. And even me and my training as an infectious disease doctor, we were told not to provide antiretroviral therapy to people who are actively using IV drugs. So there was a withholding of this medicine, this life-saving medicine from people who were just considered undeserving by virtue of their race, by virtue of whatever their, their life was. And so putting that in the words of the patients, uh, you know, for us has been a touchstone. The Declaration of Conj is something that we still refer to as the voice of the patients. And that is really, to us, comes from this understanding of social forces and social medicine, that it's not about biology. It's really about the political economy of health, who gets it, who doesn't. One more clip. Um, the results were dramatic and transformative. Adeline gained 26 pounds in one month. And I'd never seen that. Il va à l'hôpital, il fait que j'en dis, que j'en des maladies, qu'il me fait. Mais bien, ce que ça a été fait pour moi, il était uniquement préparé tout testament, ce qu'il m'a fait. Je vous ai dit de venir ici, pas bon ici, de l'hôpital Grange, que le docteur Bolot a dit non, pourquoi il mourir? Thank you. So that's uh, Sankara at the end with his two adult sons. Um, imagine the life that he was given, that he deserved, that he had a right to, to see his sons grow and become fathers, to farm the land together with his family. That's what we're fighting for. And I think to tell those stories in patients' own words and to see those images that are so powerful of people who are living 
because of science, science that they themselves fought for. And they know the connection they have in Africa. And we have many of our colleagues, especially people living with HIV in Rwanda, in Malawi, and elsewhere, who know the story of their Haitian brothers and sisters, and in some cases who have met them, and feel that connection and that deep solidarity. So um, just you know, documentary film, I think, is also a powerful way for people to tell their own stories. Thank you, Joy. Before we go to uh, questions amongst the panel, can you, um, for our viewers and, and Zoomers, can you talk a little bit more about social forces and that impact yeah. they have on HIV AIDS? Yeah, so, you know, we, um, historically, there has been this notion of social determinants of health. That's something most, ha happily, most medical students now learn about, things like housing or sanitation, water. Yet, we like to think of them as really forces. Forces, I, I was an engineer at one time, and forces have a magnitude and a direction. They have a strength and a way that they're proceeding. And if we think of these social determinants as not fixed in time and not just something that's assigned to you at birth, but something that is moving against or for your human rights and your health. And that's what we see in HIV. So for example, the story I told you of these young girls who school is not free. We know that making school free for girls particularly, especially all the way up to secondary school, is an AIDS prevention intervention, right? Not because we give them education about HIV, because we give them hope and opportunity. Hope and opportunity. We know that providing meals for people who have tuberculosis is a way to keep people on treatment and have them be able to recover their lives. Because for many cases with TB, with HIV, people have been sick for a long time and they have tumbled even further into poverty. And it were these lessons that we learned from our own patients that when we were asked at Partners in Health from the state of Massachusetts to do COVID contact tracing, we said, sure, we'll do that. We'll inform people they were at risk. We'll inform people they should get tested. But the key thing we need to do if we care about these social forces is to ask them, can you do these things? Can you isolate? Can you quarantine? And if the answer is no, then we have to mitigate and push back on those social forces. How can I get you groceries? How do we make sure your rent gets paid? How do we make sure you have diapers or infant formula? And that is the equity agenda that comes from analyzing these social forces, seeing what the magnitude is, ranking them, pushing back on them. And that's the work we have to do. And I learned that from people like Sant Kerr and Adeline from Tiofa, from, uh, from Gatoto in Rwanda, many of my friends, they taught me that. So it's not just a matter of having prep, but... Yeah, I mean, I was telling about one of our amazing students who studied the rollout of PrEP, the prevention pill that you can take if you're at risk for HIV. And she was working in a province in South Africa that was, the area was called plastic. And it was just adjacent to one of the wealthiest areas in, 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 in South Africa, in Pretoria. And plastic had, it, it was called that because people were living under tarpaulins. And it was mostly women. And most of them were supporting themselves and their families through commercial sex work. And for some reason in the study, they couldn't get these women to take PrEP. Oh, it must be culture. Oh, they don't believe in this. They don't believe in that. And when she interviewed these women, at, at peril to herself, by the way, when she got their stories, they said, I don't have the money to get to clinic. If I don't turn these tricks, let's, I mean, this was more or less what they said, then my kids won't eat today, right? Then I can't pay the school fees because I don't want my daughter to end up like me. So they're not... Uh, they, it's not that they don't have the information, they don't have the means. The forces are so stacked against them. And so, you know, when we listen to the affected, that's when we really can learn. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the story, that story is so powerful and needs to be, and thank you for telling it, and more need to be told. Any comments that uh, you all have uh, 
uh, for uh, Joya now. Yeah, I had something because we talked about it at lunch, and I just wanted to, to, to discuss with you here, which is this is you know a story that you have presented, which is of heroes who are the people of color, who are transformed and become AIDS activists. But it's also the story of this Dr. Paul, who here on the poster mm -hmm. is conspicuously, you know, the mm -hmm. white savior role. But you've somehow crafted that story to be more sensitive to the people that actually were transformed. Will you talk a little bit about that? Because the making of the story itself and the telling of it is really, really important, how it's framed. Thanks, Paris. I mean, I, I struggle with that. I work, you know, for an organization based in the United States, founded by mostly white people, although there were some Haitians uh, involved in the founding of Partners in Health. And, you know, what made us, you know, put us on the map in many ways was a narrative from Tracy Kidder, a beautiful story called Mountains Beyond Mountains, beautiful portrayal of the incredible work of our team. Um, but it, you know, it popularized an idea of a white savior. Uh, you know, the subtitle of Mountains Beyond Mountains is One Man's Quest to Save the World or Heal the World. And so we, we have to continue to elevate the voices of the people who are doing the work day in and day out on the front lines, the patients themselves who become activists, the nurses, the drivers, the cooks, the, the doctors, um, the clinical officers, Dr. Perry, um, because those are the people who are really the, the heroes. And so how do we keep telling that story and being honest with that story, but understanding that, you know, and you all deal with it as people, you know, who are trying to tell stories, you know, what is it that people will accept? I mean, the one thing also to say about the PIH narrative, and I argued with Paul about this when he was alive, is that charity is not a substitute for social justice. No. So we can give people food, we can give people school fees, but there's social determinants of health or social forces, but they're political determinants of health, right? The state should be providing yes. the housing for people during COVID. Yeah. They should be providing food for people who can't get out to get groceries, right? If we devolve it to, to basically us doing for others, and rather our government doing for everyone. We're in a situation where it all gets d dissolved to something that George Bush used to call a thousand points, thousand of, light, points of light. Exactly. And we don't need that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I would just say that, Greg, I completely agree with you. And I think as, as our students will know, the first thing we talk about in our class is what human rights really are. It's not just only about what individuals deserve and need, but it's about what are the responsibilities of government. Uh, because if you just look at, you know, blaming and shaming and this and that, you don't really think about what governments need to do to fulfill rights, not only to not torture people or jail journalists, but really what is the program for public education, for, for housing, for, for food. And um, you know, so much of our work, and I, I particularly cite Malawi, one of my favorite countries. I'm not just saying that because Atu Perry is here. Um, what am I, but because Malawi actually has a pretty strong social contract, not perfect, but when we would start a food program, we, it was, you know, or a fertilizer subsidy program, it was extending what the government could do. So the government had that program. And then we as partners in health could support the government to make it more broad. And that kind of work to me, and that's why at partners in health, we only work with public sector facilities. We don't work in private facilities. We want to support what the government is trying to do, assuming in general that the government has goodwill, which is very different than in the United States, by the way. Um, and so, to, but totally agree with you. Thank you. So we're going to move on. We've been talking about the social forces and documentary film. Now we're going to move into three artists who work in this, er, have worked in this area, continue to work in this area. So we're going to start with uh, Kia Labesha. Do you want to speak first, Kia? Kia? So, so we'll show your clip and then we'll go. Okay.
Thank you for the applause. Um, yeah, I decided not to say anything and just let you all take that in. Um, you know, something really important that I learned when I was in school was a teacher told me uh, an African proverb, which is, um, if you don't tell your story, someone else will tell it and they will tell it wrong. And I find that um, a lot of people love to tell other people's stories. You know, I'm sure you do that as a director, you do that as an actress. You've done that with your documentary. And I realized pretty early on that I wanted to be the only one to tell my own story. Um, my name is Kia Michelle Benbow, and I was born and raised in New York City. Um, yeah, hey, that's my one of my best good good friends. Um, yeah, I was born and raised in uh, New York City, and I was perinatally infected with HIV, um, which means that I acquired HIV through uh, my mother, either in utero, through my birth, or through breastfeeding. Um, my mother was not tested before um, she was pregnant. They didn't start testing women until 1995, and I was born in 1990. Um, a lot of these images are looking at my home, my apartment, growing up in New York City. I also grew up in an artist building called Manhattan Plaza, which is an amazing, incredible building filled with so many beautiful artists that were built in the 70s, um, right in Times Square area, 43rd and 9th. And no one wanted to move into these high rise luxury buildings because they were on 42nd Street, you know, and it just wasn't a safe neighborhood. So they decided to make these buildings for artists because Broadway was right there and artists could come and they could move into this building and they could pay what they could pay to live and be artists. Um, Manhattan Plaza is a beautiful place. It's a very famous building and it's also um, the building that had the most AIDS deaths, I think, in the country, um, which is a kind of parallel history um, that I think of a lot in these photographs. Um, when I was 24, I started making a series of photographs of me in my apartment. Um, the apartment is 24M, um, and 24 is the name of part of the images that you see, the self-portraits in my apartment, for the age I was and the apartment I lived in, and also there's 24 hours in a day. Um, I also started making these images of the skyline because I think that was the best part of my apartment mm -hmm. was I had the best view of New York. I could see the Twin Towers, I could see the Empire State Building, and I could see the ball drop on New Year's Eve, yeah. all at a salary that an artist could afford. Mm -hmm. My father, amazing drummer, Warren Benbow. Um, this was our apartment with my mom until they split. Um, when my mom died in 2004, she was 47 years old and I was 14. And um, in between then and now, I've felt immense grief and loneliness. And that's a lot of what these images are about and that they portray. Um, and the thing for me as a, as a long-term survivor is that growing up with HIV, I've experienced it at every age. And it's the only thing that I've ever known whereas a lot of people who have acquired HIV have a completely different experience. And sometimes when I sit in rooms with other people living with HIV, with HIV I feel a little isolated because I have a very different experience. Um, and as I've grown older and I've met more um, survivors that were born HIV positive, it blows my mind that we all have so many similar intersecting stories about what it means to have lived through a period where there was no medication and then to live through a period where there was medication, to have those early, 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 early pills being experiments. You know, My mother chose not to medicate me at that age, which was the, probably the smartest and best thing that she could have did because a lot of children and babies died because of those medications. Um, but I've also experienced it as a preteen, as a teenager, and going into adulthood and go, coming into sexual age you know, and not having anyone to talk about that. You know, there's no conversation about what it means to communicate with someone and disclose to someone that you are living with HIV as a young person. Mm -hmm. It's already hard enough to engage in sexual activity at that age, you know, and it's already horrible, the <clears throat> sex education that we have in schools. And so to not have those conversations puts young people at risk, you know, and I had to learn things the hard way. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, so many women, over half of women living with HIV will experience intimate partner violence in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. A lot because of disclosure, and if not just because of disclosure, because they're already in an intimate violent situation or um, relationship, which can lead them to then becoming HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, so with the work that I've been doing, I've been exploring my own personal narrative in a way that could be more colorful, more beautiful, um, because the images that I saw growing up were either of, you know, act up or, you know, people towards the end of their lives. And both of those things I've seen in my experience of in my own lifetime. I was obviously I was there. There are pictures of me and um, the proof is there. But I wanted to show something that was really my experience because it's something that I I never got to see, you know, and I never got to see you on ER because I was too young. You know, so I live in this kind of like little area, you know, um, and I think it's, you know, it's very hard work to do. It's not easy. It's very difficult. But I do believe that it's the thing that I've been called here to do. And um, I'll continue to make these images forever. And like I said earlier at lunch, even if they said, hey, Kia, we have the cure. We're going to give it to you today. The day after I get the cure, my life is not going to change very much because this is always going to be a part of me and a part of my story and everything that I've experienced. So um, thank you all for listening. And Thank you so much for the power of your images and conveying your life and in a way that... Uh, as you just were saying, is not often told. Comments, questions from the panel? Um, very moving, the photos. And, um, yeah, picture says a thousand words, as they say, right? Well done. Also, you can watch ER on Hulu. I know. <laughs> 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 I couldn't help myself. Oh my God, that's funny. No. no, really, really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Kia, like if, if, if there was going to be a version of ER today, if there's going to be a TV sh how would you, because I agree, your story and the story of survivors has not been told. Like what would you want to be told outside of the context of your own experience? But how would you see framing that for... Mm -hmm. Um, the world to see today, you know, if they turned on network television or, or, or Netflix or whatever. I'd just like to see more narratives about families, yeah. honestly, you know, because I think what we see a lot in these, in the AIDS narrative is a very individual narrative, but AIDS will affect entire families, two parents and their child, yes. siblings, one sibling dies, and most of us who grew up living with HIV have very similar stories in terms of not adhering to our medication because it was too hard and we were teenagers, yeah. you know, flushing yeah. their pills down the toilet, lying to your parents, um, or, you know, losing a parent or losing a sibling or losing someone who's related to you or losing your home because you lost your parent. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all of these intersecting stories and it's it baffles me to know that I keep hearing more and more and learning more and more about this history what it feels like every day. And I've lived this history, you know, and to feel that like my isolation and my grief and all of that time that I felt alone, there were so many others mm -hmm. just like me, mm -hmm. you know, from the late seventies into the early nineties, there were over 14,000 children who were born yeah. with HIV. And that's just like, you know, just, yeah. just nothing that you ever see, and I, I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's fair, and I do think that that is dangerous. And luckily now, because of medication and everything, you know, the science and the things that we know now, there are way less babies that are born with HIV, which is beautiful and a miracle, but those babies that were born, those babies that are not here, their yeah. stories are just completely lost. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I... I um First of all, thank you for your beauty, right? Oh, and showing you. those beautiful images of yourself. I think um, as, a, as a doctor that's learned so much from people living with AIDS, how do we sort of 
appreciate what gives people joy yeah. and not make it about sickness. Exactly. Because the sickness, all that is going to be there regardless, but it's what you do with what you have, what you do with the time that you have, you know. And how would you, I mean, how, you know, when you go to a health facility, when you have to do whatever you have to do, do you want that to just be very clinical, like here's your pills done, or is it, do you want to show a, a person, a, a, do you want to communicate about your joy? I mean, we talk a lot about the, the, you know, what is the life story and is it important or how is it important for us to know as providers? I think there's just like a lot of nuance, you know. Yeah. I have uh, the doctor that's in the photograph of me getting my blood drawn. Um, he was my, my doctor since I was four years old. Yeah. And he only saw me because I would come in with my parents. He wouldn't see me mm. on his own, but he did make a deal because he was like the best that they could find because they couldn't find a good doctor. And he said, if you all come in together, I will see you guys. Mm -hmm. And he almost became kind of like a second father figure in a way, or at least that's kind of how I felt like he yeah, would treat me because yeah. he, every time I would come in, he'd be like, wow, when you were four years old, you sat right there on that little chair mm -hmm. and you just, mm -hmm. you know. But um, I think there is a lot of nuance to it. And the doctor I see now, um, she's a female doctor and she's wonderful. And, you know, I go in and it's nice and it's lighthearted and I, get my blood drawn. She's like, great, I'll see you in six months, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a wonderful thing. And um, I think there's just, there's just so much more to all of these stories, you know, but there's, there's always going to be more, you know, and there's always going to be room for more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as long as people are willing and able and brave enough mm -hmm. to tell more stories, mm -hmm. I think we'll be on the right path. Kia, how do you, how do you think that the kind of work that you do and work that other artists do break stigma. How's that? How has that worked for you in your own in your own work as a as an artist? As an artist, I think for me, it's just a lot of it is being able to see another body. You know, I think to see my body, you know, the way that my body presents is different than the ways that we've seen a lot of bodies of people living with AIDS. Mm. And I think it's good to see both, you know? Mm -hmm. And like I said before, when we were watching the commercials, you know, things are always like at extremes. And I think that's dangerous. I think being able to see it all and being able to see middle ground is really important. And so by putting myself into my images and showing myself in my images the way that I wanna see myself, you know, I think very much, you know, I'm the very much the Disney generation, you know, the 90s, <laughs> we watched The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. And so when I think of those images, I think of those color palettes, you know, I think The Little Mermaid is blue and red and white and Pocahontas is purple and brown. And, you know, so when I'm working with the color in my images, I think about how color also tells a story as well. It emotes a feeling, you know, and when you see something visually, and especially with color, which is one of my favorite things, when you see color, you like immediately feel things and everyone sees color differently. You know, nobody sees it the same. Um, and so I think just being able to put this body, this facility that I have into those images and to be seen and to be seen in the way that makes me feel great, I think it makes other people also feel great too. Indeed it does. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right, um, we're going to go to Paris. Well, let me talk a bit first before we, we, we jump in. Um, I couldn't really speak after the slideshow, actually, I was so overwhelmed. Because you make a story when you're viewing it, you, the viewer, creates a story, you connect the image. Did you find yourselves doing that? You were connecting the images and seeing the recurrence of red and the dress and the, and the sky and different times and the different views of your window. I think that is so artful, but hey, hold on for a second. But it's so, it's so engaging and it made me think if one thing I've learned today just from our conversations is it's so important to not only tell the stories, but to elevate the storytellers. Yeah. I mean, those of you who are out there who are just beginning this journey are so desperately needed because there are people who are telling the stories that destroy us with great ferocity, and they seem to be very, very skilled at it. They have the right words, they have the power right now, and, and there then we have Kia, 
<laughs> and but not everyone is willing to be Kia. So what? How do we create an environment where everyone is elevated enough to feel comfortable to be a part of telling that story? And I think part of it comes to educators too. I mean, how do we elevate educators who are also being derided in the society we lived in as you know woke, you know groomers of mass destruction? How do we <laughs> reframe that narrative so that we can have a vehicle to tell the stories we want to tell? So it's, it's, it's more complicated than when I arrived here early this morning, <laughs> I thought. We've there's so much to, there, no, but there's so much to do, but I think I feel hopeful that there are people and there is this program and, and it's one of many that are doing different things like this that are beginning to, to chip away and to multiply that idea because the need is very urgent. But let me get to my clip. So for those of you who don't know P Pedro Zamora, Pedro Zamora was one of the first openly gay people who had AIDS who was on television. Um, he was diagnosed with AIDS in 1989, actually, uh, when he was 17 years old. He was a junior in high school. His goal was to graduate from high school because at that time in 1989, you were often thought that these would be the last few months of your life when you receive that diagnosis and you really, that's what the doctor told you. And you can take this AZT or whatever this drug is, but you're probably not going to survive. And Pedro was told that. He did graduate the next year, but then he had a severe bout of shingles. He became a full-time AIDS educator. That's what he did. This Cuban-American kid who's now 18 or so decided that what he would do with his life is to tell people about this. So he started speaking in schools and PTA meetings and everywhere that would have him. Um, <laughs> And then he decided, hey, there's this new show called The Real World on MTV. And if I could get on The Real World, I could spread my message even farther because I'm running out of time. That's what he felt. So he applies to The Real World. He's one of 25,000 people to be chosen for this third season of The Real World, and he's accepted. And great credit goes to the Boone and Murray, Co Murray Company for doing this. They warn the housemates that there's going to be an HIV positive person in the house. Controversy ensues. I'm sure they thought that was good for drama, but what happened went beyond that. Pedro went into the house very, very ill and eventually died on the day the last episode was aired. But in that process, he actually, you know, not only was the series highly rated, but many, many people met someone living with AIDS. And this was just about the time that Jeannie Boulet also came to television. And so what I decided to do 10 years later, around 2008, is I would write a movie about the making of that series because I wanted to tell that story again. And I felt that in this time in 2008, the statistics were not as prevalent, but very, very bad when it came to transmission, especially in my community. So I so said I wanted to retell the story of Pedro Zamora with two goals in mind, to relight the fuel and the, the idea that an educator or even one person who is telling their truth can make some change. But also I wanted to debunk a little bit of what they had done in the real world, which is to disguise and sanitize his story. They didn't show how ill he was in the reality. They kept that from the viewer. And so in the movie, and I partnered with this young writer named Dustin Lance Black, who had never written anything professionally before. The next thing he would write would be Milk, and then he would get the Oscar and leave <laughs> me behind. But this he wrote before Milk. Um, he and I decided to construct it in such a way that it also revealed basically the lie of reality television. And so we had this dual goal happening with the story. And we had the first commitment ceremony that was ever seen on television, which you're going to see. And we had a moment where his father actually sees him in his fullness, which hadn't happened until then. It did very well and it, it was great, but it, it is this kind of thing that I'm very proud of because I, I, I just want to continue since I've watched so many of my friends die and my lovers die in the 80s. I, I feel I owe a commitment to them to continue to infuse people living with AIDS in the stories I do. Most recently we did it in How to Get Away with Murder, if you watch that, if you love a, a drama. Just two of the characters just were zero different and they were dealing with that was part of the story. And, and I love that it's just a part of the network of the storytelling, that that's something that happens and they grow and they live and it has strains in their relationship. But we need to do more of that. But let me just show you this clip here and I'll explain to you why I chose these three little pieces of the movie to see. You say it's uncomfortable, or it doesn't feel the same, or it's too tight. If your partner tells you a condom is too tight, have them see a doctor. And if they see a doctor and it's still too tight, have them see me. <laughs> 
if your partner insists on having penetration sex, anal, or vaginal without using protection, there's a simple solution. Leave. No, it's okay to say to someone, no, I will not be with you without protection. When, when I was 14 years old, I didn't know I could say these things. And when confronted with sex, unprotected sex, by people much older than me, I was taken advantage of. I really wish I had someone in my life who had told me how to protect myself. Because AIDS is not a moral dilemma or a religious debate. It's a physical and mental health issue. This is about taking responsibility for our bodies, our partners, and our generation. I felt a connection and closeness to Pedro that I hadn't to anyone else before. And the one thing I knew for sure was, I didn't want it to go away. I love you, Pedro. <laughs> Um, it is a lot easier for me to face my own fears and, and face the uncertainty of my own life, um, knowing that he's there. So I love you. Okay, so um, uh, so I co-wrote that, and I didn't direct it. I was doing a show called In Treatment at the time, which I was contractually obligated to do, but Nick Oceano did direct it, and I'm very proud of him because we had three very specific things we wanted to do. We wanted to educate when we were telling Pedro, and because Pedro was an educator, we could take what he actually said, and we had a tape of that actual speech and Alex Lanius, who played him, actually did what he did in that speech and use it as a part of the show. So basically, you know, you won't always have an educator who was both funny and self-deprecating and could tell you something new. I'd never seen a condom stretched in that way. But I now have used that as a technique just to show people that, yes, it is possible for you to get into it. And we wanted to not preach. We wanted to do it in a way that because it was Pedro doing it and because there was a receptive audience, it worked. So we had the education piece there. But we also wanted empathy. And all these stories that you're doing, if you want them to work, they have to create empathy. You, they have to create, either through the characters or the story you're telling, a way in for everybody. And a father's love, in this particular case, as you see in the second clip, an acceptance for who you are. I don't know many people who don't want that. I mean, I don't know many people who don't need that. And Pedro really needed that. 
And so when we were crafting the story, we said that's going to be a pivotal moment in the story because that's a place all of us, I know I felt a connection to because I've had a very strained relationship with my father, but I, I felt that's a way that everyone can sort of feel their way into the story and relate to him. And then finally, activism. And the reason I showed you the end credits is we wanted to use the documentary format a bit after we've done the movie to show you, for people who hadn't seen it, the real people, that this man was real and this situation was real and that real people lived on, including Alex, who was the activist, who was Pedro's friend and did great things. And that sort of says, as gently as I could, you can too. That last line we have, these people have died, so many people this year, Pedro's call to activism is as, as important as ever. I mean, if I were doing it again today, I'd probably say, get off your ass. <laughs> you need to start talking, moving, telling your story, getting out there, you know, trying to change the government, voting for not the idiots. I'm not going to name names. But in that case, it's, you know, it was 2008. I was more sedate then. I just said that call to action is more important than ever. And a lot of people were activated by that movie. A lot of people were moved by it. A lot of people went back and saw the whole story. I've gotten letters and heard a lot of how it resonated with people. And when we're really talking about storytelling, if you can weave all those things together, the education, the empathy, and finally some kind of call to activism. I hate to leave the story short of the call to activism because then a lot of work has happened but you haven't gone as far as you can unless you motivate me to get out of my chair. I mean, I, I want to just absorb it and I want to feel good about it. If you haven't seen Rustin yet, that is a movie that also mm -hmm. succeeds to push us a little farther than we are before and to make some relevant connections to today. So when you're thinking about whatever the area you're going in or whatever the media, whether it's documentary or whether it's just the succession of beautiful photographs, does it do those things? Does it help you move the viewer forward? Um, I told these guys at lunch, when I was back, one of the good days I had at Harvard, which were very few and far between, but one of the good ones I had was with my playwriting teacher, William Alford, who was an Irish, crusty old Irish playwright who taught a playwriting uh, class at his house. So we would go and there would be about 10 of us and we would lay around the living room and Bill Alford would expound on our writing and give us an assignment. But he started the class by saying, you're asking for two hours out of someone's life. What are you going to give them? And I think with all of our stories, we have to think about them not for ourselves, but for the person that receives them on the end, because you are taking a finite amount of human time away from them. Is there a gift? Are you moving them in some way? Are you touching them in a way that will turn them towards a positive action? I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is in a bit of a shit show mode right now. F forgive my French. Don't we need almost if not all of the stories we do, to be part of pushing the boulder forward. Because unless we have an army of millions of people pushing the boulder forward, we're not going to make it. You know, there's the climate, there's, you know, our, our rights, as, as Greg was talking about, abridged at every level. There's the healthcare crisis, there's so much to do. So we need a huge army. Uh, and that army needs to proceed with love and sort of push this boulder up the hill. So that's what I'm most excited about. And, and I try to do it, and, and, and Gloria will talk about another opportunity I had to do it, but I try to infuse it no matter what the show or the story I'm doing, and I try to find a way to make it about something that helps us move the boulder forward because I don't want to be Sisyphus. Did Sisyphus ever get the boulder no, up the hill? No. He lost. no, no, I don't want to lose, and I don't think we can afford to lose. So I encourage you to continue to push. Thank you. I think. <clears throat> you know, what you're saying about bridging the gap between inspiration, which I hope our stories and our photography and our documentaries do, to action and giving people actionable steps is a way that we can all, our students do that right now, um, in thinking about using the arts and humanities, but making sure that it's not just informing, which is important, but pretty much we know about HIV. We don't know who has it yet, even though it's 2023, we're still, still in the dark a bit about that as a, as a, as a society. So we have to tell those stories. Um, we're gonna move to Gloria because um, she's gonna show some clips. And uh, do you wanna say anything first, Glo Glo or no. no? Okay, so we're gonna show some clips from ER and then we'll uh, have Gloria speak and then uh, 
we'll continue with our panel. Hey, Jane. Hi. I just traded your husband out. Ex-husband. Still, I, I, I didn't realize that you've been going through all this. Unfortunately, it's Al who's going through it. I mean, I'm doing what I can to help. So I guess you guys have been separated for a while? Yeah, quite a long time. And the marriage was over long before that. I guess you didn't feel any need to get tested. No, no, I did. I got lucky I was negative. I'm glad. Yeah, I gotta get this suture kicked again. He is just swung from the patient. That's a central link. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you heard I was here. Well, I'm better now. It must be the jail. Why did you tell Mark Green about me? I didn't. Then how does he know I'm positive? I don't know. We were married. I guess he just assumed. He's not assuming, Al. He knows. Well, it didn't come from me. Did it ever occur to you to go to a different hospital for treatment? <laughs> My insurance is still a mess, and I know the doctor's here. I know the doctor's here. Well, even if they found out, they couldn't fire you, could That's they? That's not the point, Al. Do you think at all about what I'm going through? This is not just about you. I know this is not just about me. I... Then act like it. Jeannie. Look, I know how mad you are at me, and you have a right to be. Living with AIDS, that's nothing, but knowing I gave it to you, there's no pill for that. I just have to face it. Every day. Hating me might feel good, but it won't change anything. It doesn't feel good, Al. Nothing about this feels good. Um, it's a tough day. It's a big day. Um, storytelling can make a big difference. Uh, it's a very personal, this uh, storyline came from a personal close friend. So it was personal, it continues to be to this day. And um, I wouldn't be able to have done it without Neil Bear, who was executive producer on the show and writers, one of the writers, and he had Genie's back. Paris, director, I haven't seen Paris in I don't know how long, and um, it's like no time has passed, my friend. Uh, I remember uh, a while ago, while I was still on the show, I was at uh, CVS or something, and I was looking at a wall of toothpaste. And I just was, I couldn't figure out which toothpaste to get. I'm like, why do we have so many toothpastes? I'm standing there, and a gentleman comes up to me, a young guy. And uh, he says to me, um, excuse me, I don't want to bother you and just want you to know that I watched the show last night and um, I'm HIV positive. I'm going to my doctor to start treatment. So storytelling can make a difference. There's been some great stories, more to come for sure. 
told in a variety of different ways. Pedro, the work that's done globally, beautiful photographs, your personal story. Philadelphia has an incredible film that really was a groundbreaking one. There was an HBO movie called Life Support starring Queen Latifah. Nelson George wrote and directed that piece. It was about his sister who was HIV positive living in Brooklyn. And she became an activist. And uh, I did a, I had a, a part on that movie and it felt really good, you know, a number of years after ER and just these kinds of commitments to keeping the story out there. And these stories, it's, you know, when I hear about the statistics in the South, in 2015, I read in the New York Times, I don't know, maybe on the 13th page or something, I like the tactile thing about it because I just kind of was way in the back how AIDS was the number one killer of young black women in this country between the ages of 25 and 34. And I made a point to go out to colleges and start talking about it for, you know, protect yourselves. And I don't care what the rap, like just, you know, live your life, but protect yourself. Awareness, testing, treatment. Lack of the, the first scene where Jeannie lies, you know, the shame of it and the secrecy and the stigma, those are killers in any part of life. So the story about releasing the shame, shame and stigma and secrecy. If Jeannie were to be reignited, uh, you know, 20, oh gosh, how many years? Don't say it, like a long time. Um, I would see her, I could see her. Her, she has a zero viral load. She's divorced, the son that she adopted, the HIV positive son that she adopted, is thriving and is at college studying documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeannie is, she was a, a physician assistant on ER, she's now a physician, she's a doctor. And she's living in the South. And she's opened up her own clinic in these areas where HIV AIDS is rampant because of the secrecy and the stigma and the shame. And so the access, the awareness, the access and the treatment and all of that. And also I see her running for office so she can start changing the laws in some of the, in the state where she now that lives. Must. So that she, you know, that, so, <laughs> so that this primal necessary uh, issue is, ta is taken care of, you know? Just like uh, in life support, HIV positive woman becoming an activist. Yeah. I remember somebody talking to me about, you should run for office. I'm like, oh, no, I swear too much. There's no way that <laughs> I would last about a day. But I'll do what I can. We can all do something. So, Neil, I thank you with all my heart for you. everything that you've done for asking me. Oh my gosh, I need a cocktail so bad right now. Uh, <laughs> no joke. I think we got that coming. You don't have to stop your feelings. <laughs> you know, Gloria, add one thing about what your demand was when you decided to do the show. When we came to you and we said to Gloria, that in 95, right when we had the treatment, um, but things were still pretty dicey what you said to us. I said, I will do the storyline, even though it was, you know, at home and at work, or in my personal life and at work, I'll do the storyline with the promise that Jeannie will not die from the virus, because it doesn't have to be, it's not that way anymore. People were getting their lives back. And also, it's like, it's my face out there. I don't want this face to be the message of HIV or AIDS equals death, you know? And thank goodness for that, because here we are how many years later with all of those episodes being rerun. 
I have a new generation of people coming up to me saying, oh, you know, I, I love you on ER. I'm like, well, that was about 100 years ago. But they just saw it again, you know, for the first time in their 25, 30, 35, or whatever. Thank goodness, you know, because there's always hope. Right. So important. And we asked John Wells to bring uh, Gloria back in 2014 to show that she was living a fulfilled, active, healthy life. And that had just hadn't happened, but because Gloria had asked that, you know, maybe more dramatically it would have been, you know, compelling to have that character die. But this was really finding more truth and also Gloria bringing her own story uh, to the show. So um, I'm really happy that in perpetuity, <laughs> uh, what I wrote, what, what um, Paris directed and what Gloria acted in is there. And um, thank you, Glo. We have, we have uh, some time for you all to kind of sum up, leave us with you know, what we can do, um, where we should be going uh, today and tomorrow. So please um, feel free to chime in. <laughs> you mentioned the film Philadelphia. I, I was timelining this out in my brain this morning or yesterday and um, Philadelphia came out in what, 93, 1993? And Tom Hanks won an Academy Award for his portrayal in 1994. And it wasn't until 1993, early 1994, that women could actually, the illnesses that women and people who were born with female reproductive organs, their illnesses were not a part of AIDS definitions. So, that same year that Tom Hanks is getting his Academy Award for his portrayal, all of these women have been fighting and dying because they can't get Social Security, they can't get the CDC to recognize them as people living with AIDS, they're losing their children because they can't go to work because of mm. pelvic inflammatory disease and chronic yeast infections that are just so debilitating and they're not being recognized. And the films that have come out around the AIDS epidemic like Philadelphia or like Angels in America, The Normal Heart, you know, all those big films, but there's never been anything as big as that to showcase a woman's story, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're part of that history of being able to show one part and thank God your character didn't die. That's an amazing thing. But there's never been a film or something as big as that dedicated to this story. And I think this story is a very important story and it makes absolutely no sense why those histories just completely go, not erased, but undetected, undetectable. Undetected. They're undetectable. Is that, is that the name of the yeah, film? That's the name of the film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, just thinking in terms of like perspective. I thought about that this morning on my way here. I was like, what year did that come out? But yeah, so. I think that that's a really important point. Greg, you said something to this, this afternoon we were at lunch about MPOX and who got it. So I think it relates to the present still. Do you want to just, would you just speak to that for a moment? So um, many of you in this room know that we had an outbreak of 18 months ago of MPOX, um, mostly endemic in West and Central Africa that sort of rocketed around the world among men or sex with men. Um, as with HIV, as with COVID, the people who got the vaccine were white gay men in urban centers. Um, and if you watch the CDC bar graphs about the evolving incidence of, of MPOX that summer and into the fall, you saw it go from white men to black and Latino men. Right now, this, this week, WHO and, and others have, have said there's a new MPOX outbreak in DRC in Kinshasa, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, of clade one, um, which has ne not, never been sexually transmitted in that context before. Now we're seeing it among MSM, men or sex with men and sex workers. Guess what is also not there? No vaccine and no treatment. Mm. And so all these sort of injustices that we've been talking about, um, 
just keep it you know, perpetuated. I just wanted to pick up on one thing that Paris said about pushing the boulder forward. We're in, in an existential crisis right now, right? We just went through a pandemic. We have climate change coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the next shoe that's going to drop? And so we can talk about the media, but the media is a vehicle, right? We talk through the media, we talk through films, we talk through documentary, we talk through photographs, but change is the object, right? And so everybody in this room should follow the advice that we saw at the end of the, the Pedro clips, that there's more work to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's what's important in the context of, we don't memorialize, we don't do World AIDS Day just to memorialize the dead. Mm. Um, but we do it to make sure that we don't see this happen again and again and again. Yeah, I, I amen to that, Greg. I mean, I I was reflecting on when I met the fine Greg Gonsalves, and we thought it was either the 1998 or 1999. I hadn't yet started at Partners in Health. I was a newly minted HIV doctor, um, going to help Africa, you know, going back to where I had been in Uganda. And I met this very handsome, uh, <laughs> young man who was not a doctor, was not a nurse, and was insisting that people in Africa, this is 1999, mind you, uh, have access to CD4 counts, have access to antiretroviral therapy. Have, and I was like, who is this guy? He doesn't understand Africa. Well, I learned from Greg and from many people like him, Eric Sawyer, who you saw in the film, and then from my own colleagues like Atoto and Sam Nomodole, that the people who are living with HIV were the most powerful spokespeople. Mm. And they're the ones who taught me about corporeal politics. Put your body where you care, right? Put your body where you care. There are protests you can join. There are letter writing campaigns, you can join. There are ways that you can use your art, use your work um, to move the needle. And I think one of the most hopeful things in my life has been participating in popular movements that worked. Today, there are 37 million people on the globe that get access to antiretroviral therapy for free. That is because we, we stood up, we fought together, together. And so I would say that is the, that is the antidote to despair is activism. And you know, we talk about that a lot and, and it means people come with different skill sets, um, but it's such an important part of optimism and hope in the face of despair. Yeah. And the short version of what I would say is, um, it takes one person, really. I mean, I'm a little bit changed for this afternoon and for having met you guys and talking. And I think there's something for all of us to take away that we didn't have coming into this room before. And maybe we'll be in a position, as John Wells was, one man saying, I want to tell this woman with HIV story. I'll, I'll tell it. I'll put the chips down on it, and I'll tell it, and bring those people together, and then we said, you know, 40 to 48 million people watched that on a Thursday night because television was different back in those days. So literally one in six people in America saw that story and was, and many, most, I think, were affected by it. So if one person can be in a position, in that case, to change the trajectory of something, that's great. But maybe we're not changing big things in what we're doing. Maybe we're making a documentary that is changing the hearts and minds of three or four people and their lives are different or making them feel heard. And then those people go and they speak and they create their art and they communicate with their family. And then those families go out. So there really is a butterfly effect to all of this. So you shouldn't be, I mean, we're talking a little bit from a place of you know, we have a big megaphone, relatively speaking. Your megaphone is just growing, but even as it grows, when it affects one person, it affects so many. You know, just like we're sitting here in the room and X people on the Zoom are also getting this and taking it forward and saying, huh, maybe I should rethink that story. I'm saying, I know I'll rethink a lot of stories having met Kia. I'll rethink a lot of the way people are characterized because of that. And that's okay. And that flows out. So I don't, I don't want to end with the fact that the world is going to shit. What I really want to end on the fact is all of us have enough wings to bite it, you know, to hit it back. It's just we have to ignite other wings that then ignite other wings. And am I taking the wings thing too far? A little bit? <laughs> but it just that keeps going on and on and on. So the power multiplies itself, but you have to start it.
yeah. with your idea, with the thing you care about. I read so many of the majors that people were doing and how they put it together were so interesting to me. And I said, ooh, that's needed. Ooh, wouldn't it be great if we had that? There's so many possibilities that you could start this effect going. And it's okay just to start it. That's it. Exactly. And also, you know, like going back to the first commercial that we saw, you know, that that um, if that image of the balanced narrative is somehow in that, you know, if one person is sees themselves in some way, then again, they start talking about it or they start thinking about it differently. Um, I think I may have made a faux pas. I think I had said that um, in 2015, it, yes, what I meant was 2005, <laughs> AIDS was the number one killer of young black women. And I remember when Hillary Clinton was um, campaigning for president, she was at Howard University, and um, I was sitting watching, I don't know, Meet the Press or something. I'm such a geek, but it was great. But uh, she, they had a clip of Hillary Clinton saying, if AIDS was the number one killer of young white women in this country, there'd be an outrage. And I remember leaping off my sofa. <laughs> that one moment has stuck in my head. So sometimes just one moment just, you know, that you just kind of carries you for a while. So I hope that when you next look at a, a wall of toothpaste, that it might, <laughs> those wings will just <laughs> fly. Yes, and I'd just like to say, lastly on my part, that December 1st is not the only day we should talk about it. So. Yes, amen. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, it's, it's, it's really tough when we see the statistics and we see how far we still need to go, but you've given me a lot of hope and you've lightened my heart, and that's the first step to um, making us, me and others, move forward. So thank you. Thank you for your inspiration and your stories, and we'll look for more. Yes. yes. More. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you on Zoom.